Hello and welcome to the fourth and final of the MOOC live sessions. This week we'll be tackling the wine economics module. So I'm joined here by Hervé Anna, uh, who's the director of development at the Institute of Haute uh, Etude de la Vigne et du Vin. A, uh, I'm also joined by Samson Zadmara, uh, who is a PhD student in economics. So uh, we're here to present the live show. Uh, my name is Tom. Um, as you may remember from the first live show, I'm a student here at Montpellier Supagro, studying a master's degree in viticulture and enology. Uh, we're going to tackle our questions today uh, in subsections, um, as you'll see as the live develops. So to kick us off, um, the first question is, in what way do very large operators, such as Advini, Castel, um, some of whom are the result of a merger of several cooperatives, how do they risk radically transforming the landscape of French supply on the domestic market or even for export? Well, I'll go ahead and answer that one. Well, effectively, there are really big uh, players on the market, but when you look at it from a, uh, like a, um, a percentage, like the top five biggest uh, companies only represent 20%. So even though they are important, they're not, they don't have such a big impact on the market. So if you really want to understand um, the market, the French market, the French wine market, the best way is to really go through product segmentation. And that would be like seeing if it's a table wine, a, um, a PGI wine, or a PDO wine. And that's really the best way to, to understand where the French wine market is going instead of looking at strategies of, of big companies. They do have an influence, but um, the French market isn't that concentr concentrated. Now, if you want to have some more information on that, you can always go on. Uh, there's a French ministry uh, department called France Agrimaire, and there's a lot of extra information on that. Now, what's important, I would say, with these uh, companies like Advini is probably their marketing strategies because they really bring some new stuff to the market and uh, new strategies on how to. Uh, sell wine, especially in exportation. So, uh, and they also have their own, um, they, they, they do like a dual system where they have uh, products for export and then they have their own domains that they will uh, sell and produce wine and sell in France. So I think that covers pretty much the first question. Okay, thank you very much for that. So moving on to question two. So this is about uh, appellations in France. So. Perhaps you, uh, Hervé, you could respond to this question for us. Uh, so since the 2009 reform, um, does the organisation or the syndicate still have a time frame to continue developing or converting to the, the PDO or AOC labels? Yes. Um, in fact, you are right to, to, to uh, remind that uh, uh, there is a specificity in the wine sector regarding uh, the appellation of our regime, the PDO, um, on, a, on a European um, uh, level. Uh, in fact, um, in, um, it's not the case in the cheese sector, for instance. In the cheese sector, uh, you, uh, all the appellation of our regime uh, became, uh, have become uh, appellation of our regime protected, PDO, in the European sense. In the case of the wine sector, there is a, um, an agreement between France and uh, Europe to uh, get all the AOC, Appellation of Origin, controlled, um, uh, controlled in, in France uh, for them to, be, to become directly Appellation of Origin protected, PDO. So um, the uh, all the all the uh, PD, P, uh, uh, CDO uh, wines are considered like uh, PDO wine. The wine growers can uh, put it in the label. Uh, they have the choice. They they can uh, conserve. This is a specificity. It's not the case in the cheese sector, but in the wine sector, uh, the. Um, the organization of um, um, appellation of origin in France and all the, the association of defense have chosen to um, to conserve 
this uh, possibility to put AOC on the label. So they can choose it. Appellation of origin controlled or uh, appellation d'origine protégé, PDO, uh, on the label. They have the, uh, they have the choice. But it's legal to use the ancient system because it's, uh, since it, is, uh, it has been recognized automatically by mm -hmm. Europe. Okay. Um, w would you be able to just clarify and perhaps summarize for us the differences between, you know, we have IGP in France and we have AOC and, and how those different classifications work? Yes. Um, um, indication, uh, indication geographic protégé, protected uh, indication of uh, uh, geographic indication, PGI. Mm -hmm. PGI in, um, uh, for Europe and P, um, uh, PDO uh, are the, the European terms. Um, in the case of uh, appellation of origin, the PDO, um, it is um, linked to a very specific and generally um, a limited terroir. Mm -hmm. some, some of these terroirs are very, very limited. Sometimes for, um, I think that uh, the, the most limited uh, must be uh, three or five hectares. Okay? But um, in the case of um, um, PGI, indication geographic protégé, it can be a very um, a large territory. For instance, in uh, uh, Occitanie, we have uh, uh, PEDOC, PEDOC, which is a PGI. Okay, so the quality of this wine is linked to the uh, all these conditions on a very huge territory. Mm -hmm. well, it's rather mm -hmm. okay. so, different. So we're, we're saying basically that with PGI we have a we have a broader area, whereas with the AOC it's it's, it's more homogeneous yeah. the area. Okay. So perhaps to move on now to the section on internationality. Um, so the first question here is, what is the evolution and the position of the UK supply uh, on the world market? Well, with, on this, the question for supply, it's kind of an interesting question because I guess this is directly linked to uh, global warming. <laughs> Up until now, I guess you couldn't plant any grapes in, uh, in the UK. And so <clears throat> I think it's just a really, really small... Um, geographical zone where they're starting to plant grapes. So in terms of supply, uh, there's really not much that it would represent. So it would probably just be negligible. And when you kind of ask who would be planting, well, what we're hearing is it's mostly people from Champagne who are going there to maybe produce Champagne. And who knows, maybe we'll have some British Champagne, but <laughs> until then it's Right now it's French, and then I'm not sure they will be allowed to call it champagne. It would be sparkling <laughs> British yeah, wine. Yeah, very so. surprised <laughs> if they let the, the champagne name go on to British uh, sparkling wine. Um, but so I suppose following on from that, how, how long English wine, I suppose, is not viewed as, as, mm -hmm. as being globally renowned. So do you think it would take quite a long time before UK wine would be able to sell on a global level? Well. First, I mean, it all depends how much you would be able to produce. And then, you know, the UK is one of those countries where I think with the United States and maybe China are countries who are consuming more and more uh, wine. So maybe they might even be able to sell it. And this is just hypothetically on their own uh, market. So mm -hmm. it would be first maybe the British market, you know, maybe some British wine for British people. And just like, I mean, just like this Japanese wine for Japanese people and nobody ever... Like in France, nobody ever really hears about Japanese wine, but people in Japan actually have their own, a bit of their own wine. Yeah. And uh, so I think it would first do, be something national before it takes off internationally because they would really have to, you know, work on becoming you know, famous or, or work on creating their own brand and, and uh, an identity. Sure. Okay, um, so moving on to question four. So during this module, we looked at five emblematic markets, including France. Um, so can either of you tell us anything about the Russian market? So with regards to its evolution, its sources and supply channels, uh, and then maybe pick up on how popular French wines might be in Russia. Yes, uh, maybe some figures about the uh, Russian market. 
uh, Russian market uh, is, uh, of course, is interesting because um, uh, it uh, it's uh, rather various and uh, it can uh, interest, of course, many uh, uh, luxury products. But uh, in fact, if you consider it in a, in a global level, uh, we can see uh, when, when you when you study the OIV figures about Russian that uh, it's uh, it has been less than 10 million hectoliters and it tends to diminish these uh, recent years so uh, the, uh, the, pro the consumption is less than 10, uh, 10 million hectoliters and the production also is less than, than uh, 5 million hectoliters uh, tending also to diminish so it uh, uh, the Russian um, inhabitant uh, consumes uh, less than uh, eight liters of wine every year. So it's uh, uh, five, uh, five times less than a, a French consumer. And it, uh, 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 most of all, it, it's, uh, it, tends, it doesn't tend to, uh, to, to get um, better. So it's a market maybe uh, rather mature at this, uh, this level and mm -hmm. not so important uh, for the, at the global, um, global level, but uh, normal, normal market. Not, so, um, um, not many promise about it. Yes. Okay. And in terms of countries that Russia imports from, w w which are the main countries that the Russians are drinking their wine from? Uh, in, um, if you consider the, the importations of uh, Russia, of course, the place of uh, luxury products like uh, champagne and like uh, Bordeaux wines uh, and uh, in, uh, in general, uh, many uh, appellations of origin, uh, French wine, are mm -hmm. concerned. And uh, it can be interesting for exportation for, um, for uh, French wine producers it can be uh, important, but it's not increasing as it, it has been uh, uh, expected some years ago. I see. Okay. Um, so now to move on to our second section, which is organic wines. Um, so the first question in this section asks, what is the current state of the market and the consumer expectations for organic wines in France? And how does this link, in, link into biodynamics? Well, uh, in France, it's a big kind of crisis that is starting to emerge, but not only linked to wine, it's more like people want organics and, and everything. And um, there was kind of a big problem recently in Bordeaux where, you know, some people were, they were kind of seeing if there was cancer or not. I mean, nobody can really prove it, but there was pesticides near schools and that kind of created a big, uh, a big system, a big People were really upset of, you know, having pesticides next to, next to schools. So, so that's one of the the reasons why people would be trying to go towards uh, more organics um, from from like a, the the population side. But then there's also grapes becoming more and more resistant to uh, diseases. And so, if you keep treating them more and more in the long term, well, you're going to have to put more and more product and they're not, it's not going to be um, really efficient. And actually here in, in Montpellier, at Supago, and with the French Institute of Wine, uh, they were developing some new uh, grapes that were able to, uh, that have like a dual resistance. Uh, that's one of the real big projects in, in here in, in Montpellier, uh, where they don't need to be treated as much. And mm -hmm. so if you, if, you, if you go that way, where you're really doing organic wine without even just because the grape uh, the, the vine is able to to resist without having to be treated that much but i would say that the people are be, the price is there's more and more wine organic wine coming on the market it's more and more affordable and there's a real trend of uh, uh, biodynamic wines and it, i think it's becoming more and more uh, more popular but I don't have an exact uh, number of the percentage, but it's it, it's getting more and more popular. And then mm -hmm. it's also linked to uh, 
you know, agritourism, and like if people do like uh, um, this magnificent, uh, because you're always comparing, let's say, we would say organic wines with, I guess, the, the small farmer. I mean, it's still kind of linked to small sizes. It's still not like a big, like Advigny, for example, like all their stuff is not organic. So you can easily link it with like agritourism or wine tourism where you'll come and visit the wine estate, maybe spend a night there. And so these kind of things go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Yeah. Maybe we can add, add yeah, something if you're... Uh, uh, the, the organic wines, um, uh, of course, uh, uh, have, uh, have gained a, a very good audience these uh, recent years because it gathers uh, um, the, the producers and also the consumers, consumers and everybody, and uh, also the citizens. Because all these people think that we have to change the way to produce w wine um, in, a, in a better sense. Uh, first of all, to protect the health of uh, producers and the consumers and everybody, and also to, to help um, uh, to uh, protect the environment. So it's uh, generally considered that uh, organic wines are the best way to go that way. But that doesn't mean that it's, um, uh, it can solve all the problems mm -hmm. with that. First of all, we can say that uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the last uh, eight years, the, the areas in France have, um, have been um, uh, multiplied by three. So it's a very, very uh, clear evolution in, the, in this good sense. But at the end, um, uh, it's important to uh, remind that uh, uh, the, uh, the, the whole areas of uh, organic wines are not more than 5% mm -hmm. in all this uh, uh, supply. And um, it's, uh, so it's a very uh, big question. Uh, are we going to a generalization of this uh, way of production? Or is this uh, maybe will it uh, um, become a, a, a big, but uh, uh, what we call a niche in, yeah. in French, uh, so yeah. a, a, a little segment. Mm -hmm. For the moment, um, many people um, um, are fighting in the, uh, among the producers, among the citizens and the consumers, also in the political sphere. Uh, uh, many people are engaged to, um, to give a, a better um, part to uh, these organic wines. But uh, we can say that there are many, many uh, 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 obstacles uh, still to, 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 to solve. And uh, first of all, and Sam told it very well, that uh, the, the, technical, the technical level, there are many difficulties Mm -hmm. the, that are um, uh, organic uh, wine growers are uh, facing. Yeah. I mean. Okay. So uh, to move on swiftly to question number six. So this is all about vegan wines. So can a wine be considered vegan? Uh, under what circumstances? And uh, what is the impact of this on the market? <laughs> Good question. Well, frankly, I've, I've never heard of a vegan wine yet, personally. Uh -huh. um, I don't really see why it, it couldn't, but I'm not, I don't, I'm not an authority on, on this, on this but, question. It would be, I don't think we put any eggs in wine, so... As, as, <laughs> as far as I understand, there are, there are techniques used in fining wines, whereby mm. you can use gelatin yeah. or, or egg whites. So in the end, you don't have the animal product in, in the wine that's in the bottle, but it has been used in the winemaking process. Well, I mean, if, yeah. if, if you're using it in probably in the process, then I would think no, because you're still using it in the process. So mm -hmm. I would think it would disqualify it, but, but that's just, I can't really, I don't know, maybe I'll be. <laughs> yeah, maybe we, we have studied uh, all this, uh, this new tendency uh, with uh, our students. and. Of course, it's a very, very little part of the market, but it's a trendy part of the market mm -hmm. for some uh, segments, uh, new segments of consumers. 
that are interested in that uh, way of consumption in general for the food also and that uh, 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 considering the wine offer in vegan. But in fact, it's not so hard to produce uh, vegan wines because uh, it's, uh, you have only to avoid uh, uh, fish glues mm. and uh, eggs, uh, but it's not, not, not so difficult. Some, I know that some producers are in uh, bio, uh, organic producers and uh, biodynamic uh, refuse because they use a, a horse and uh, yeah. maybe uh, it, it, it can be uh, bad considered but, yeah, but, <laughs> but it's for, for the moment it's very uh, little part of the market maybe it can be de developed in the future we don't know but for the moment it's uh, limited okay um, so the next question um, I suppose ties in slightly with what we talked about already with organic wine but Maybe it's best to touch upon biodynamic wine as well, and, and how this trend might be increasing uh, in the future. Yes, um, yeah, uh, all the biodynamic wines are included in the uh, organic With wines. With an organic, okay. okay. So I told you about the uh, real uh, proportion of organic wines, in fact. But it's true that um, uh, the the biodynamic uh, wines know uh, very interesting uh, uh, increment uh, these last years. It has been um, supported by many uh, great names of the production and uh, it has uh, taken advantage of uh, all these, uh, these uh, very well, uh, well marked uh, uh, brands and, uh, and names in the in the wine sector so uh, the consumer that um, knows the biodynamic wines generally consider that they are uh, good wines and they have a, a plus uh, ways of protection of health and uh, environment so it's very well considered uh, I know that th there, there are some um, difficulties uh, for the um, uh, the biodynamic sphere to be totally uh, um, in phases with a scientific uh, classic sphere because mm -hmm. some of uh, some of the uh, practice are uh, well uh, limited and uh, and uh, framed some others are less explained by the classical science and some uh, some uh, parts of this uh, process are not very well explained and um, this is a, maybe this is a, a, a little break for the, for, for the development but uh, it doesn't uh, 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 it, although this is a, this is a fact uh, the biodynamic production is developing uh, uh, especially in these uh, high segments mm -hmm. yes. I see. Okay, so to move on uh, to now another section, which we'll discuss capsules. So in France, when we buy a bottle of wine uh, in the supermarket or the retailer, we see that there's a capsule uh, on top. So there's a couple of questions relating to this. So firstly, what exactly does the capsule correspond to? Um, and what is the relationship between the colour of the capsule and the wine's tax category? Well, so the capsule corresponds to... Um uh, the fact that you paid your taxes on alcohol. So in France, you can't just go... I mean, there's a lot of restriction, I think, in it. probably in France or in any country in the world when you want to produce alcohol. You have to have your license, registration, and then when you want to sell it, you got to also have, like, all different sets of rules, and, and, and that's just uh, bureaucracy. So when you put a capsule... It's like this aluminum with the, I think there's the symbol of uh, Marianne, which is like the French uh, woman uh, who represents France. So that means that you pay your duty. Now, I think there's different colors. Um, I think red is probably PDO. I'm not, don't remember correctly, but there's green and red, and it depends on if it's, it's table wine. Yeah. I think it's, it's, green. it's Yeah. So, so that's uh, pretty much, it's just the fact that you pay taxes. Okay. Yeah. And yes. that it's allowed to be sold, so, so yeah. And for those who are interested in this uh, uh, color code, uh, 
before it was uh, the green was only limited to uh, uh, video and uh, what we call VDQS, uh, van délimité de qualité supérieure, uh, when the blue were uh, only for uh, van de table and van de pays in the, in the ancient um, uh, segmentation. But now everybody also can use uh, the red, the red uh, lit de vin, red, since uh, uh, 2011. Okay. okay. But, but the important is a Marianne, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I guess talking further about the bottles, um, we don't see that many French wine producers using screw, tap, screw tops on the bottles. Um, yeah. So what would be the reason for this when we compare to maybe New Zealand wine mm -hmm. producers where screw tops would be a lot more common? Well, that comes down to production. I mean, you know, you have to, if you want to put a screw cap, you got to have a machine that produces a bottle with a screw cap, and then you have to have a bottling machine that processes screw caps. And so France historically is smaller, has smaller wine estates, and so just to give an example of how it works, you have sometimes trucks that come to the estate and actually bottle the wine. So like the estate won't own its bottling chain or bottling processing machine. And so then if you want to have like a, a, um, a screw cap, then you have to find the, the right machine and the right system. And it's, it's, it's pretty complicated, in my opinion, to, to be able to, to coordinate that in, in France. And then you also have to make sure it seals right. And I think you, it probably, I mean, it's this sort of a thing where if like you have two technologies, well, if one's already working and everything is in place, it's cheaper for them to, to keep that technology. Whereas like New Zealand started from scratch, so they started right away with the screw cap. And so that, that's, that would be my, my interpretation. And then I think in France, you know, from a consumer point of view, people still prefer corks. And this is still kind of a quality symbol. Yep. So I think that's kind of breaks breaks down the, the, the reasons, the technical and the consumer side. Okay. So so the French consumer presumably more than perhaps the New Zealand consumer perceives a screw top bottle as being bottle holding some lower quality wine. Yeah, well and, and I think it's it even, I would even go further than that. Like in you know in Italy you can have like wine in tetra pack because that's just the way that that's unheard of in France. You'll never find like a a brick of wine. <laughs> so it's it's just uh, I think French tradition and that's what they like and and, and they, you know they kind of invented it so I think they can stick to it. <laughs> sure. Okay we have perhaps time for one more question. Um, so just very quickly talking about climate change how do we think climate change might affect uh, the distribution of production of wine um, and the global market? Uh, uh, climate change is a very important factor for the, the last years. It can explain many changes in the production and it put all the future in questions. Uh, it reminds all the wine sector that it will be obliged to, um, to organize a new evolution. Uh, first of all, uh, maybe with uh, new innovations in the way of uh, producing uh, grapes, in the way of uh, um, growing uh, wines also, uh, and uh, to organize themselves to face this evolution, because these evolutions are very, very important. Mm -hmm. uh, it impacts, of course, um, uh, the development of the, of the vines, but also many uh, um, uh, many uh, things like uh, like floods, like uh, uh, the drought, 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 drought uh, and uh, uh, the fro fr froze also, mm -hmm. and it's a uh, very hard uh, for the, the produ producers, and we can see the effects uh, in many parts of the the wine world from now, and we are we can um, we can. Th think that it will be worse in the next years if the producers don't uh, organize themselves sufficiently uh, to face with uh, technical ways and maybe also with uh, uh, changing of uh, uh, changing the, the, the places of production 
we were um, talking about uh, United Kingdom uh, some minutes ago, for instance, but it showed that uh, uh, the lands, lands uh, I mean the, the places of production could change in the next years uh, due to the climate change, of mm -hmm. course. Okay. Right, so we're just about out of time for today. So thank you to everyone for your questions and thank you for participating in the MOOC over the past four weeks. Uh, we just want to remind you of a couple of things before we close off. So we've extended the evaluations until Sunday evening, so they will still be online for you until then to complete. Uh, we will also be sending you a satisfaction questionnaire so you can let us know how you've got on with the MOOC and what you've enjoyed and what might be improved for next time. So I'd just like to thank the entire teaching team over the past month for putting this all together and for delivering all of the content and the live shows. And thank you to Sam and to Hervé um, for being here and answering our questions today. So we'll now be handing over to Cécile for the live session in French. Um, I wish you all a very good day and we hope to see you again for another week in the future. Thank you.